<clears throat> well, that's good stuff right there. Yeah. That still is one of my favorite songs. I might be a little bit too loud, Brad. That's still one of my favorite songs. Yes. And there's some of you that are here today that are here to see my little brother Dalton get baptized. But you know, if I was to ask him, if I was to ask him what his prayer would be, it would be that all the ones that he loved would love Jesus. Amen. Yes. Um. How many of you know that God knows everything? Amen. How many of you know that God has a divine appointment and a time for everything? And you might be here to see Dalton get baptized, but you're here because God sent you here. Yeah. Yes. He just used Dalton to do it. Amen. Yeah. So if you're here today and you're undone without a holy God, I'm talking to you today. And if you're here today and you're struggling with something and you turn around and you run from God, I'm talking to you today. And if you're here today and you can't find your way, I'm talking to you today. And I'm in a suit and I feel uncomfortable. I know you probably do too, but you'll find out why in just a few minutes. But I feel the Holy Ghost this morning and I just I feel like preaching this morning. Go for it. And one, minute, one thing I didn't mention to you that I will now because I just love food so much is we're going to be feeding you after the service if you want to stick around because we need to rearrange the chairs. <laughs> but I'm going to be in the book of Joshua this morning. I love David in the, in the Old Testament. I really, really do. I love David. I love Moses. I love Abraham. But there's just something about Joshua that just gets me. And this morning we're going to find our book, ourselves in the, in, in the chapter 7 of the book of Joshua. And we're going to be talking about a man named Achan this morning. But I guarantee you that you can replace the name Achan with your name and you're going to fit in here somewhere. I promise you that you will. So if I had to title this thing this morning, it's called Sin in the Camp. And if you want to go from glory to glory, and you want to go from where we're at now to where God wants to take us, guess what we can't do? We can't do it with sin in the camp. Right? Amen. We can't do it with sin in the camp. So what I want to ask you this morning before I ever even get started, one, we talk about this all the time, is why are you here, and what are you doing, and what are you doing, and who are you doing it for? Is there sin in the camp, and what are you hiding? Because we want to get to the next step. So that's what I want to ask you is what do you have? Now, what are some things that some people can hide? We'll get into that in just a minute. But for some reason right now, it just feels like I need to talk about somebody hiding disobedience. I don't know your heart. But the way the Holy Spirit works is he walks up and down the avenues of this church. And he comes back and he whispers in my ear. And he says, hey, you need to say something about this. That ain't me. I don't have your phones bugged. I don't have cameras at your house. I don't read your text messages or emails. And I certainly don't check your mail because that's a federal offense. But God knows your heart. And I'm simply here as a messenger to tell you to stop hiding. To stop running. Get it out of the camp. Because you're going to find out here in just a minute as we read in the book of Joshua what it's going to do for this entire church and this community. And it's an eternal problem, not just for you. Okay? Y'all stand with me for just a minute in the book of Joshua chapter 7 and verse 10. Stand for the reading of God's Word. Don't stand for me. Stand for God's Word this morning. The book of Joshua chapter 7 starting in verse 10. Listen as we read. It says, Then the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel has sinned. And they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and disassembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more except you destroy the accursed from among you. 
Oh, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thy enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. Father God, as we come before you this morning, I just love you. God, I thank you for the presence of the Holy God that we can feel now. God, I just pray that you would stick around with us for just a little bit, Lord God. Use me as a mouthpiece, Father. Let me decrease in myself and increase in you. God, let this word go out to these your people. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. And I used to do this a little bit, and I'm going to go right back to it. I'm going to read from a different translation because I want to make sure that this hits home and we understand exactly what's going on here. Because Joshua, as you know, was chosen after Moses failed. Joshua was chosen to lead the children of Israel. Soon as they crossed the Jordan River, you remember that at the time of harvest that the, the river was overflowing in its banks. In other words, it seemed like a hopeless situation. There's no way to get out of it. But God said, if you just step in the, in the river, I'll do the rest. Just step in the river. And the Bible says that it stood up on heaps on itself and they walked across on dry land. Similar to how they did at the Red Sea. Right? So, so when they get across, the first city that they come to is Jericho. Now Jericho was a small city, but it was a big city and the walls on it were so thick. They even used to race chariots and stuff around the top of it. That's how thick the walls were. But God gave them a specific plan. He said, I'm going to give you that city. All you have to do is walk around it 13 times over the course of seven days. That's it. Now I doubt we could be able to do that today because he tells them to be quiet and don't say a word <laughs> while you're walking around and y'all know that's not going to happen today. People just cannot shut up sometimes when they need to shut up. It's okay to say, hey, man, it's the truth and you know, there's a reason and the older that I get, I find out that I've got two ears and one mouth because it's better for me to listen twice as long than I talk. Yeah. I'm telling the truth and y'all know I am because I'm fixing to touch on gossiping and if I hurt your heart, I'm so sorry. Mm. But it's all in the church. It's all outside of the church. And when you act like that, you can't expect folks to want to come into the house of God when you act worse than they do. Mm. But when you stand up here and you look out there, it doesn't appear like we have that problem right this moment. And I talk about things a lot. Sometimes I repeat myself week over week. And the reason that I do that is because the Bible says that without a vision, the people perish. Mm. Is that the truth? Yeah. Most of the time, the vision is given to who? The man of God, the preacher, the pastor, the evangelist, whoever. The vision is given to him. And if I don't remind y'all of what that vision is, then we're going to perish. Mm -hmm. So you can't have your house full, Brent, until your house is full. Once we begin to get full, and we begin to get to where we swell up with God and nothing that we do is nothing but about God. And God is number one and not number twelve. That's what it means to be full of God. <coughs> my phone is running off the hook to the point where my wife said something yesterday. She said, you must be paying these people to call you. <laughs> people are noticing. People that are 60 miles away in another town calling and asking for prayer and all that. And you know what he said to me? I've known the guy for 20 years. And he called me and he said, I need prayer because my wife has a spot on her kidneys that they think is cancer. I rebuke it. She's in her mid-40s. I rebuke it. But he said, I knew that if I called you, one, you would pray for me, and two, you wouldn't judge me. I'm not your judge. But if I say something that hurts your heart, it didn't come from me. I'm not your judge. I told you last week, I'm the chief sinner in this church. If you knew some of my past, you wouldn't even want me up here. But some of you have accepted me because you know the love of God that's in your heart and that's how we're supposed to be. So he told me to walk around this city one time for six days. And then the seventh time, walk around it seven times. And then you're going to blow on the ram's horns and then you're going to shout and the walls are going to come tumbling down. Is that what he told them? So they go in and they do this thing and the walls come tumbling down and guess what he told them to do? He said, go in there and destroy everything. Don't take nothing. Destroy everything in the church except Rahab. Is that the truth? Except Rahab, a harlot, a prostitute, 
Somebody that we would look down upon today. Somebody that we would shun today. So I'm going to encourage you sitting in here today that if God can use a prostitute, He can use a you. Two spies that she kept in her home and lied about it. Yeah, she lied about it. And she said, the only thing I want to do is just find enough favor that God would spare me and my family. Hey, that's all I want, William. Is I want just enough favor from God to where He can spare me and my family. And the Palmers can sit here and tell you today that my family and my children are all saved and they're all baptized and they're on the way to heaven. There's no more favor that we want than that in our life. Because you know what happens is when you get that kind of favor in your life and you get that kind of salvation in your life, it doesn't stay on the inside. You can't help but let it explode to other people. And just by the way that you live, people are going to say, I want what you got. They're going to want to come to church. You don't have to do anything else but live in that favor. Just like Joseph had from his dad. That's all I want. I remember reading where Noah, this wasn't even in none of my notes, and I ain't even looked at him yet, but y'all just hold on just a second. I'm going somewhere with this. I promise you that I am. But I remember reading when Noah didn't get anybody on the ark except for him and his family. That's it. Everybody else on the entire face of the earth died. And God come down and he shut the door of the ark. There is no getting on that ark anymore. It said God's own hand reached down and shut the door. That was not Noah's fault. It was your fault for not listening. Don't let that be you. Because we are truly, truly living in the last days. If anybody don't see that, I want to tell Dalton that I feel like that God really has something special for him in his life. Because I really feel like there's something special about him and that God's going to do something with him. But I don't know how long that's going to take, Matthew, because I don't know how much longer we're going to be here. I would be lucky if I get put in a pine box myself before the eastern sky splits. And that does not bother me whatsoever. So today, if you can't say that it doesn't bother you, if God comes back, you are a very special guest this morning. And I'm asking you, what are you hiding in your camp? So I wanted to read this real quick, and then I'll get right back on track, because I want us to understand what he said here. He said, but the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why are you lying on your face like this? Israel has sinned and broken my covenant. They have stolen some of the things that I commanded must be set apart for me. And they have not only stolen them, but have lied about it and hidden it among their own belongings. But there's a way that he did that. That is why the Israelites are running from their enemies in defeat. For now, Israel itself has been set apart for destruction. I don't want to be Israel. You don't want to be Israel. We need the power of God and the hand of God on our church, in our families, in our community. And we cannot do that with sin in the camp and hiding stuff. We can't. I will not remain with you any longer unless you destroy the things among you that were set apart for destruction. Get up, command the people to purify themselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Hidden among you, O Israel, are things set apart for the Lord. You will never defeat your enemies until you remove these things from among you. What are you hiding? What are you hiding? What did you take that you weren't supposed to take? What are you not doing that you're supposed to be doing? What are you lying about? What are you trying to deceive others about? Why do you get up on Sunday mornings and put your clothes on like it's okay and everything's all right and you hide it all and you put a jacket on top of everything and you go to church? What are you hiding? A couple of things that Aiken never learned. And one was you cannot hide from God. You can't hide from God. He's all low. He's all powerful. He already knows the condition of your heart as you sit right here today. And as it begins to get tough for you to swallow, understand that that's okay. That's all right. Because you still have an opportunity to accept the thrice holy God that you're going to stand before one day. Because if not, then I'd be concerned 
that he had turned you over to a hardness of a heart and won't call you again. People don't believe that can happen, but it can. There comes a time to where God says, I'm done playing games. Because he said, I'll call and I'll call and you'll refuse. He said, but then you're going to call and I'll laugh at your calamities and I'll mock at your fears. That's what the Bible says. I didn't say that. This is not a scare tactic, y'all. This is the truth. I want us to understand how true that it is and how close we are to the coming of, of God. And you cannot look at this earth and say there's nothing else out there. Oh, there's something else out there. This did not explode and come to fruition like it is today. There's a God that is in heaven that created this just as the Bible says. And if you believe in any one single part of this Bible, then you have to believe it all. I can't believe the pieces that fit my life. I have to accept it all. This is my daily bread, not my daily cake. So we accept it all. So if you created it and you love me and I have to serve you, awesome. If I don't, I go to hell. It's that simple. We have to accept the whole thing. So I want you to understand the importance that it's almost over. It is almost over. And even if it does take another 20 or 30 years, there's no guarantee God says that you're going to live tomorrow. It's not a scare tactic. But does anybody know that you're going to be here tomorrow? So if for some reason that bound is set in your life for tonight or this afternoon, can you say that everything's well with you and God? What are you hiding? What are you hiding? Is there sin in the camp? Hmm. I can imagine when they went down to fight AI and they went to spy on it to start with and they looked and they said, hey, there's not that much over here. Don't trouble everybody. Just a couple of us can go. Just a couple of thousand can go up there and wipe these guys out. No problem. This is after Jericho now. <coughs> Achan was there walking around the walls with the rest of them. He knew not to take anything just like the rest of them. So they went and they spied on Ai and they said, yeah, just a couple thousand of us. We can take them out. No problem. Well, they lost. 36 of them died. They ran and they fled. And what happened to the leaders of Israel and Joshua? They were dismayed. They tore their clothes off. They fell on the ground before the ark. They threw dirt on their head. This shows the, the greatest humility and frustration to a point. And Joshua has, I'm not going to say has a right to be frustrated, but I remember reading over in the uh, first chapter of Joshua where God told him, don't fear. He said, be strong, be courageous. I'm with you. I got you. I'll always be there. You'll be greater than Moses. Do these things, but be careful and follow the instructions as you're supposed to. That's what he was supposed to do. So Joshua felt like he did the right thing. Now Joshua said, God, what are you doing to us? The first thing he does is he starts to blame the Lord. He starts to blame God and he said, man, um, would to God that we would have just stayed over on the other side of the Jordan. Isn't that what they said when they were wandering around in the wilderness? The same people that walked across dry land in the Red Sea was fed in the wilderness, walked across the Jordan on dry land. The same people that the walls of Jericho come tumbling down. Now they're frustrated because they lost the war. So he starts blaming God. God, what are you doing to us? I thought you was always going to be with me. How many times do we go through stuff to where we blame God? We question God. God, what are you doing to us? We, we do that too. So it would be fair to say that we're no different than Joshua in this aspect. But then God says, hold up, son. It wasn't you. But I'm not going to be with Israel anymore until y'all get this fixed. So he said to call all the tribes and the tribe that I say is it, then you dig a little deeper. But then you go into that family and then you go into that family and then you go into that family. That's what the scripture says. So I want to ask you if God come by and he said, hey, let me go to all these churches in Louisville. And he stops the resurrection church and says, yep, this is, this is one right here that's got an issue. So then he starts going to each family. 
when he come to your family, would he be able to nod and say that the family is good, or would he be able to say, that's the family that's got something going on in it? Because that's exactly how Achan got caught. Because you can't hide from God. You can't. You can fool me. I'm not the one that matters. I don't care how much money you put in that box right there. You cannot fool me. I don't want your money. I want your family and your heart and your soul to belong to God. That's what I want. So don't be in it to fool me. Don't be in it to fool your spouse. It's not even about your spouse. Don't even be in it for them. The next thing that Achan learned or never did learn was he never learned about the progression of his sins. Sins progress. And they've been progressing the entire time in the Bible. I'll take you to Joshua chapter 7 verse 21 here when Achan gets sawed out and gets caught. And this is what he said I did. He said, when I saw among the spoils of a, God, a goodly Babylonian garden and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold, 50 shekels in weight, then I coveted them and I took them. You see what happened there? He saw it. Then he coveted it. Then he took it. If I take you back to the book of Genesis in chapter 3, can you find the same thing there? Can you find the same thing to where Eve looked at the apple? Well, I'm sorry, the fruit? We don't know that it was an apple. She saw the fruit. Then she saw that it was good to look at. She desired it. She wanted it. She coveted it. Then she took it. Progression of sin. Then I take you over to 2 Samuel and I, you find King David. What happened to King David? Everybody else was out fighting the war and he wasn't. He walked out of his house one day and he looked across the rooftop and he said, whoa, what is that good looking woman? He saw Bathsheba. He desired Bathsheba. He wanted her. He coveted her. He took her. That's the progression of our sins. It, it hasn't changed. The enemy is still the enemy. But God is still God. That's the part that we tend to forget sometimes. God is still God. So that's the progression of your sins. You see it. Then you see it again. Then you covet it. Then you want it. Then you make yourself think that you need it. Then you make yourself think that it's owed to you. Then you take it. And then you have to hide it. Remember Adam and Eve hid themselves. You remember he hid his stuff. That's the progression of your sins. That's something that Achan never did learn. Another, another thing that Achan never learned is your sins will find you out. Your sins will find you out. That's, that's biblical. The book of Numbers right here, uh, 32, 23 says, But if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord. And be sure your sin will find you out. You can't hide from God. There is a progression of your sin. And your sins are going to find you out. There was a pastor in upstate New York years ago that was, was going out on Saturday nights and he would go out and he would pray for all of his people in the streets. And he found himself walking for miles and hours and realized that it had gotten late so he jumped on a bus and took a bus back to his house. Well, when he gets up on the bus, he pays his bus fare and the guy gives him his change back and he, he gave him too much change. Well, the pastor puts the money in his pocket and he goes back to the back of the bus and sits down and when he gets to his location, he comes up and he's counting money again and he stops at the bus driver and he says, Sir, you, you gave me too much change. He said, Yeah, I know. He said, I did it on purpose. He said, I visited your church for the first time last week and I wanted to make sure that you were a man of integrity. Rest assured, your sins will find you out. So if I play the devil's advocate here, what if that pastor would have not said a word and put that money in his pocket and walked out? 50 cents? $5? $500? Does it really matter? No. You see here, a garment was taken, silver was taken, and gold was taken. Doesn't matter what it was, he was told not to take anything. So he never, he never figured that part out. But your sins will find you out. Another thing he figured out or didn't ever found out was he didn't learn that his sin affects others around him. His entire family 
his livestock, his belongings, everything was taken. They were stoned and burned. Your sin affects others, not just you. If you need another example, look at Jonah in the boat. The next thing that we need to understand that Achan didn't understand was that we need to deal with our sins swiftly or God's going to deal with them sharply. He had an opportunity probably to make it right. When he picked it up to start with, he, he should have known right then what I'm doing is not right. And he, he could have dropped it. He, could, he had an opportunity to make it right. I believe he even had an opportunity when he took it home and he dug a hole in his tent and he buried everything in that hole because it said it was hid in the earth. He, he dug the hole and he put his... I, I believe if he would have come clean to Joshua right then, maybe this wouldn't have happened. So we have time to deal with our sins because if we don't deal with them swiftly, God's going to deal with them sharply. I don't want the wrath of God on my life. If something comes my way because God sent it to me, i got to deal with that. But I know He's going to see me through that. But I don't need any help getting anything coming on me because of disobedience. I know, I, I hope I'm not the only one there. I don't need any help making things rough. But then the, the, the another thing that He... Oh, just in case you're wondering how do I deal with my sin, that's an easy one. 1 John 1 and 9. It says that if we will confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That's how you deal with it. And then another thing that He didn't realize and He learned just a little bit too late was you don't take away things that belong to God. It's one thing to take stuff, but it's another thing to take things away that don't belong to God. And then the last thing that he didn't realize is it's all in God's time. That's the last thing that he didn't realize was it's all in God's time. Well, what does that mean? Well, the second time that they went to Ai, chapter 8, guess what he told them? You can take the spoils out of this one. You, you can take out of the cattle out of this one. All he had to do was wait one more chapter. In God's timing, God gave him permission to take the second time they battled him. It's all in God's time. Sometimes we jump the gun a little bit too early. So this morning, coming to church, I figured that I would dress the part since it was a, a wonderful occasion for a baptism. I figured there was going to be some people that were going to be here that normally don't come, and we love you, and we're glad that you're here. But I wanted to ask you, is there sin in the camp, and what are you hiding? So I figured I would dress the part this morning. But what you don't know is you've been taken to the cleaners. You only see what's on the outside. But I know what's on the inside and so does God because he saw me getting dressed. So if I was to take off my shoes, things ain't always what they seem, are they, brother? Who comes to church with half a sock? What are you hiding this morning? I've had that tie for 13 years. So when I ask you this morning, what, what are you hiding from God this morning? I don't care what you do during the week. I don't care who you call. I don't care how much money you pay. I don't care what you watch. You cannot take your Sunday clothes and put over top of your garbage and come to church and think that it's okay with God. See, y'all thought that I looked real good today. Y'all thought I looked real good today. <laughs> what are you hiding this morning? What have you taken that you weren't supposed to take? And what have you put under your tent? What are you hiding from God this morning? Church, it's time to get absolutely real with who God is and what God deserves and what God needs from His people. 
It's time to stop running and stop hiding and stop being disobedient. And I'm turning this thing off because it's fixing the echo. But it is absolutely time for us to stop acting like church, like people tell us that we're supposed to act. And act like God wants us to. Because when I come in here, y'all thought this man's got it all together. He's got everything together. But you didn't know what was on the inside. I don't know what's on the inside of y'all either, but God knows your heart. That's the same way. So what are you hiding this morning? Can you honestly say that everything is okay between you and God? When you got up this morning and you took in a, took your clothes out, laid them out on the bed. Maybe some of you prepared last night. Maybe some of you decided that you would iron last night so you wouldn't have to this morning. What sin did you try to cover up? Y'all know that I'm telling the truth. Some people are looking at me like a calf staring at a new gate, and that's okay. I don't normally wear this kind of stuff, but this is why, because I wanted to show you that you cannot hide from God. You can make it look okay to people, but you are not okay. But I am here to tell you that Resurrection Church tells you that it is okay to not be okay. We're not here to judge you. We're not here to condemn you. We're not here to hold you back. We're here to set your face going forward. And tell you that it is okay that you a jacked up, screwed up mess. It's all right. We're going to love you anyway. I prayed that God would send me to the, the people that were tore up from the floor up. Messed up from the feet up. Beat up from the chest. I, I prayed that God would send me all those people. Because church is not about what you grew up with people. I'm telling you that for truth. Because I've lived it and I've been there. I was brought up in a free will Baptist church where my granddaddy was the pastor and he pastored several churches and I don't know why people preach with these things on. I can't stand it. <laughs> but he left you feeling like you would never be enough. You would never measure up. You could never do what God wanted you to do. You could never be what the church said you could be. You would always be trash. You would always be garbage. You're a sinner. You screw up all the time. Spend all day praying for forgiveness. Why? You really think God would give you something that He knew you couldn't keep anyway? That's what salvation is. You get the true salvation of God and you live the best you can. And when you've got that salvation in your heart, guess what's going to happen? When you mess up, the Holy Spirit's going to convict you. If it don't convict you, then you ain't saved. Y'all can clap. That's okay. That was good preaching. Yes. <coughs> what are you hiding this morning? You ain't got to tell me what you're hiding. Just tell God. Be real with Him. Be clean with Him. That's how we're going to keep the enemies at bay because I want God's hand to stay on this church. This is my responsibility as this church. My family is first. So I have to stay clean. Then this church comes. I want this church to have the hand of God on it. I don't want the church to not be able to fight the enemies that's coming against the church even to this day. People don't think I need to be pastoring because I wear blue jeans. People don't think I should be pastoring because I ain't been to seminary school. I don't have a theology degree. I don't have a bunch of letters behind my name. I don't want the letters behind my name. I didn't read anywhere where Paul went to any kind of seminary, theology, college, or none of that mess. Because you know what you're getting when you go anyway? You're getting somebody else's opinion. You're going to sit in a desk all day and write papers, and they're going to tell you what they think this scripture means. I don't want to know what you think the Scripture means. I want to know what God says the Scripture means. So what are you hiding this morning? Is it deceit? Is it disobedience? Is it porn? Is it drugs? Is it alcohol? Let's be real. Let's be real. God's real about it. God is real about your addictions. God's real about your deceit. God's real about your adultery, your pornography. He's real about all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to be real about it in the church. If it makes you uncomfortable, talk to God. He shouldn't have put it in the Bible if it was going to offend somebody, right? So what are you hiding this morning? It's time to come clean, church. 
There is another place that God is trying to take us. And I'm not just talking about physically, even though I know that's coming too. I'm not talking about physically. There is another realm of spiritual goodness that we have not seen yet. And it very well could be because of sin in the camp. Come on. And somebody hiding something. <clears throat> Can you truly feel good about yourself playing that you're a Christian and going home knowing that you're holding back God's movement in a community? Come on. I have given my all to God. Have I messed up? You better believe it. You better believe it. I have quit this church so many times it ain't funny. I've even had contemplated thoughts of suicide before since I started this church. Am I lying? Some of y'all didn't even know that. Brent talked to me for two hours and went out on the way home. Because y'all, it's hard doing this. I'll go in the hood all day long at 2 o'clock in the morning. I'll bust up in a meth head's house all day long. But this scares me. And this is the hardest thing that I've ever done. And I don't want to be the one to keep God off of my house, my family, or my church. Can I get a commitment that we don't take stuff that's not ours? And hide from God? Yes. It's not always what it looks like. Five minutes ago, I looked good. I'm not going any further, by the way. Praise God. Praise God. I know some of y'all were scared about that. Probably most of y'all. But I'm just being real. This whole church that... You're sitting here right now. I don't know who you are, but you do. And you're lost. You realize for the first time this morning that you truly aren't saved. Because this message didn't sound good to you at all. But I do want to tell you that There's still time to make it right. Let's all stand. If I could just get you to bow your heads and close your eyes for me. I don't want anybody looking around but me and the Lord. But you know one of the things that people hide in their tents, some people bury it. And they bury it deep too. It's pride. The Bible says that pride goes before the fall. The Bible also says that God resists the proud, but He gives grace unto the humble. Somebody here this morning has quote unquote been saved for years until this morning. You realize that you're not. But you also have this thing in the back of your mind that says, I can't get right with God because everybody thought that I was okay. Can I tell you something that if anybody ever says anything about your true salvation, that they're the ones with the problem and not you? The Bible says that He rejoiced when He found that one when He left the 99. And if we as a body of believers can't rejoice when that one comes home, then we're the ones with the problem. Yes. So I'm going to ask you this morning if you know 100% without a doubt whatsoever, nobody will ever change your mind. There's nobody looking around but me and God. If you can take me back to a time and a place where you know that heaven flooded your life and your soul and you know for sure. Can you raise your hand this morning knowing that you're going to heaven no matter what happens? Amen. Thank you for being honest. If you can't say for 100% sure 
that I'm saved, bona fide, born again believer of Christ, and I know that I've been saved, I live it, I've been saved, I can take you back and tell you when I was convicted by a holy God and He turned my life around. If you can't say that 100% sure and you just want me to pray for you, that's all I'm going to do is pray for you. I'm not coming to you. If you can't say that, would you just slip your hand up and all I want to do is pray for you. I see that hand. I see that hand. Thank you, Lord. I see that hand. I see that hand. Thank you, Lord. I just want to pray for you. And I'm going to keep my commitment. Is there anybody else before I pray that does not know for sure that you're saved this morning? Amen. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to keep my word. Father, I love you so much. God, I thank you for sending this word out to your people, God. Lord, you said that your word would not return void. And God, for the people that raised their hand, God, there's families that need put back together. God, I just pray this morning that you would give them the courage to accept you into their life. Yes. God, go with us to the rest of this service. I love you. It's in your son's name. I pray. Y'all keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. If you raised your hand this morning that you didn't know if you were saved, could you just look at me? I'm not coming to you. I just want to look at you. You know God loves y'all. You know God loves you. You know there's nothing that He can't do and He can't fix. We're going to play these songs and I'm going to ask uh, Brother Dan and Brother Greg if they will come up here and Matthew. If y'all would just come up here and stand in the front for me for just a minute. We're going to play this last song and listen to me y'all. <coughs> the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. 